Everyone, how are you doing today? Great. Well, I celebrated my 41st birthday last night, and I'm over-caffeinated right now, so we're going to be having a lot of fun today. All right. Um, so, uh, as you can see, I'm wearing my APT costume uh, here. Uh, you, know, you can't go to any conventions in Atlanta because we've got Dragon Con and Anime Week in Atlanta without being in costume. Uh, you know, so uh, you know, I got my balaclava right here, and yeah, I'm a hacker. All right. <laughs> Bad stereotypes. All right. <laughs> so, um, you know, our presentation uh, today is going to be entirely finance based. Uh, you know, we're not going to get into uh, systems and other things. Uh, we're going to talk about companies that have been hacked, uh, how it's affected their stock prices. Um, you know, take a look at the, um, you know, top line revenue and other things to see if uh, customers really are leaving. Um, you know, I've uh, dealt a lot with. Uh, uh, investors as well, so we're going to talk about how to deal with uh, hostile uh, investors uh, on the board and uh, a little bit of uh, treasury and cyber uh, insurance. Uh, you know, that's kind of a hot topic that's been coming up a lot today. So, uh, you know, it should be interesting. And then finally, if we have time, we'll get into uh, a hypothetical exercise over defending your information assets using no IT, lawyers, accountants, and no technology. All right, so uh, disclaimer first, uh, no uh, facts are involved in here. These are all opinions, so don't try to sue me for uh, slander or libel. Um, all opinions are mine, none of my clients, uh, employers, or anything like that. Unless you want to sponsor, I'll gladly take your money to say anything you want me to. All right. <laughs> no offer to buy or sell securities. We're going to be talking about the uh, stock market, so I'm uh, not a licensed uh, financial advisor. Uh, so you need to go and get personalized advice from someone uh, who's a licensed uh, financial advisor, accountant, attorney, or whatever it happens to be. Seek sane and qualified advice. I've had plenty of people tell me I'm insane. Uh, if you think I'm insane at the end of this, uh, my attorney wants to talk to you. Uh, you know, and if we have enough names, uh, I can get away with anything. Awesome. Okay, so um, years ago I was working at Internet Security Systems back pre-IPO, uh, which was uh, really fun. Yeah, go ISS. <laughs> uh, but I took a turn out of uh, technical infosec and got into compliance. Oh God, it's one of those compliance guys. Um, you know, personal reasons, uh, you know, compliance, you know, from an InfoSec perspective, you think PCI and other garbage like that. Uh, but, you know, compliance is an interesting uh, field. It typically reports to the board of directors, so even the CEO has to worry about us, which is cool. Um, you know, and we deal with a lot of things like anti-bribery, anti-corruption, child labor uh, in your factories, environmental regulations, conflict minerals, stuff like that. You know, it's a topic that's important to me, so that's why I made the uh, switch. Um, you know, I'm a financial researcher, uh, kind of a semi-pro. Uh, I'm also a certified treasury professional, something you probably don't see in the uh, InfoSec world uh, quite a bit, uh, you know. And then uh, I'm also known as a cost cutter and an activist henchman. We'll be talking about activist investors and what they can do for your information security budget. Um, my email address is up there that also works on the Skype or link. And uh, my Twitter handle is Dearest Leader. It's easy to remember because Kim Jong Il is Dear Leader, but he's only loved in North Korea. I'm loved and respected everywhere. So that makes me dearest. And that's just how I troll, bro. Kim, I'm laughing at the ridiculous haircut. All right, so fun stuff. Uh, I do. Uh, a lot of volunteer animal rights and environmental work. Uh, I've been a nightclub promoter uh, here in Atlanta booking DJs and live acts um, since 1998. And used to be a model and I appeared in several role playing game supplements. That's actually me on the far left. <laughs> so back when I had hair. <laughs> uh, so, you know, uh, a lot of cool side activities. Uh, you know, the wardrobe also uh, lets me get into stock photography too. So uh, yeah, that's where I make uh, a lot of my money these days. Uh, so, just so the talk is what we've been told is wrong. This is like the History Channel, uh, you know. But instead of looking at pre-Columbian Viking ruins and civilizations that we've dug up, we're going to be looking at numbers etched forever into the Nasdaq. You know, there's a lot of bad information out there, and uh, you know, a lot of myths, uh, such as North Korea hacking Sony. 
Uh, the only way that could have happened uh, to get them off of the abacus and into something modern is if aliens helped them. So you heard it here before it airs on the History Channel. <laughs> All right, so getting into the presentation. <laughs> Uh, you know, we, we hear stories that if you get hacked, you're going to have irreparable uh, reputation damage, your customers are going to leave, the board's going to get fired, and you'll get hacked out of business. Uh, you know, this is FUD that the, um, you know, vendors have been saying for a long time, and everyone wonders why this doesn't work on executives. Well, you know, it turns out that that's not really correct, so we're going to turn your world upside down like this cat, cute cats. Um, and what we found by drilling into the numbers is, uh, you know, companies really aren't getting hurt from this stuff. Uh, there's a lot of consumer apathy out there. And, uh, you know, we're going to look at numbers to actually show that, uh, you know, this is the case. So let's put on our thinking caps, classes in session. Uh, we'll cut straight to the big boom. And what we uh, have done here is hypothesized that hack companies are going to go out of business. So how would you do that in the market? Well, you know, you'd use back testing, which is putting on hypothetical trades at a uh, previous date and testing to see how they turned out today. Uh, you, know, you hear um, theories like sell in May and go away. So you, know, you should be in the, in the market for the first five months of the year and then get out until the next January. So you, know, you can look at cyclical things and see if this works or not. So what we're gonna do, hypothetically speaking, is short sell 100 shares at the market on the close of uh, the market on the day of the, day of the breach. Um, so short selling, for those that aren't uh, familiar with the market, you borrow 100 shares from your broker, you sell it at the current price, you hope the stock drops, you buy it back at a lower price, pocketing the difference, and then you give those shares back to your broker. Uh, and what we found here is going back to 2011 is that uh, very few companies have actually gotten hurt and had you actually done this, which I don't recommend, uh, is that you would be down $55,574 assuming that you shorted 100 shares of each one of these companies every time they ended up in the news. Um, so looking at this says that you should be buying the dip, hypothetically, rather than shorting it. So, uh, you know, you're probably thinking, wait a minute, you lost how much money by doing this? Oh, we thought they were going out of business. You know, this, sh this should be a surefire thing. Well, uh, it turns out that things are different in the uh, market. Uh, please direct your uh, attention to the video screens closest to you because this is a little difficult to read. Um, so what we did was we took a look at Target and XRT. XRT is the entire retail sector exchange traded fund. Uh, you know, so it's a bucket of retail companies. And uh, we're looking at the time frame uh, around the breach. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we can see that, yeah, Target performed lower than the rest of the retail industry, but there's not a big divergence uh, with a sharp vertical drop uh, in the uh, uh, stock price. So this kind of says that, ah, things are flat. There's nothing really going on there. But, you know, let's take a look at Target after the breach. So this is uh, from Black Friday into uh, you know the uh, preceding quarter, and uh, you know you say, oh well, look, they got hacked. Look at the stock price. It's, it's going down, and it hit an all-time low. Well, you know there, there's several things here when you dig into this chart that stand out. Number one is that the implied volatility statistic up in the uh, upper left-hand corner, and this mouse is not going to work, uh, is 25%. And uh, what we have here is we have a gap on earnings day. So that says that Target beat expectations. You have a gap whenever um, you know, the opening price is significantly higher than the previous day's close. So people were buying this thing like crazy, and it's just taken off since then. So that's not a indication of something that's really hurting. Implied volatility is um, the supply demand for derivative options. You know, so this is insurance, you know, put options in the market. So people were not buying insurance on their portfolios, uh, expecting things to go really south. Now, when we look at Walmart, oh my God, that looks exactly the same. Did I have the same chart? Uh, no, these are, these are two different charts. Well, that's interesting. 
Um, so, you know, implied volatility is 23%. Walmart's a bigger company, so you would think that they would do better, uh, you know, not surprising there. But look at this, we have a gap down. So as far as Wall Street's concerned, even though Target got hacked, they're doing better than Walmart. So here you had the price open lower than the previous day. There's a small gap in between here. Now let's look at the whole market. Gosh, did I get my charts mixed up again? Because this looks like uh, Target and Walmart. Uh, you know, let's go back. Uh, yeah, they do look a lot alike, okay? Uh, so if we uh, follow the hypothesis, the whole retail sector must have gotten hacked. Uh, and th this here is very interesting. The implied volatility statistic is 52%. So that is twice the risk of the entire retail sector uh, versus either Target or Walmart. Now, if we think back to Christmas shopping season 2013, uh, you know, we had the polar vortex going on. It was cold. People in the Northeast couldn't uh, get out of their houses. So, okay, this is uh, probably to be expected that uh, things, uh, you know, went south during the uh, shopping season. Now, if we look at Target today, and we got the breach all the way over here, uh, you know, they are up about 20 bucks uh, from their low during the uh, bad shopping season in uh, 2013. And, uh, you know, Market Watch says that their Black Friday sales are up 40%. Okay? This does not sound like a company whose customers are going to uh, leave them, but, you know, they're not the uh, only ones uh, out there. Uh, you know, Home Depot is in exactly the uh, same situation. Uh, it's uh, gone up quite a bit, uh, high of $117. And, uh, you know, the Wall Street Press is all about, you know, on who cares about uh, you know, the uh, Home Depot data breach. Now, if we do get into technical analysis of uh, Home Depot, you know, we can draw a couple of trend lines uh, here and see that it's in a bullish up channel. Uh, and uh, we also have the 50-day simple moving average, this thin blue line here. And uh, this is where, um, you know, traders will look and say, oh, well, if the stock's doing well, it's going to be above that line. And, you know, we can see here and here uh, the stock has touched that line. A lot of people have come in buying. You know, its the next candle is green, and it goes up uh, from there. Uh, so, you know, we're not really uh, seeing that there's anything uh, wrong with uh, Home Depot. Okay, Anthem on the uh, day of the breach. You know, we've already got a bullish trend line uh, in here. And, uh, you know, we can clearly see that the stock bounced off of this. Didn't really go anywhere for the, the rest of the day. Uh, but the interesting thing is this purchase right here, uh, somebody bought 59,894 shares in a single order and dropped uh, you know, roughly $8 million on this stock at one time. Uh, you know, so again, would we expect uh, you know, this company to be going out of business if the professionals, this is obviously not an individual investor, but if the professionals are plowing this kind of money into Anthem? Right? And you know, if we look at the correlation index here, it's highly correlated to the S&P 500. Uh, you know, so on days that the S&P 500 is uh, up, Anthem is typically up. It's just one of those staple stocks that tends to do well. Uh, here we have a horizontal trend, so we have a double top. Uh, stock went below that, bounced above it, and you notice it bounces off of it here and continues upwards. Uh, so we got a uh, bullish channel. 50-day SMA is trending upward. Uh, we have a MACD, uh, moving average convergence divergence, bullish crossover about to occur again. The relative strength indicator is starting to point up. Now this thing's probably got uh, some legs to run a little further. Uh, it didn't get below this horizontal support. Uh, you know, so it, unless something really wild happens, uh, it's going to continue up. Oh, and notice the 50-day SMA suddenly turned sharply upwards after they got breached. Strange. All right. Uh, this one's a little more difficult to, to read, so I don't like reading, reading PowerPoints, but I'll read this one for you. Um, this is a press release from Standard & Poor's the day after Staples uh, got hacked, and it says, we have seen many instances of payment-related data breaches at retailers we rate. In all of these situations so far, the costs companies incur because of these breaches end up being manageable and have not had a material impact on credit protection measures or consumer behavior, all right? So 
It's not me up here as the crazy guy saying, oh, this stuff doesn't matter. S&P is out there saying that, yeah, nobody cares about that. So, you know, while you're thinking about, uh, you know, Santa Claus not being real and companies uh, getting hacked out of business. Why not real? No, Krampus is, though. Oh. <laughs> Uh, you know, we, we, we have to think, all right, what's, what's going on here? Well, first of all, uh, you know, the, the, the truth of the matter is data breaches aren't really hurting companies today, okay? It's just not happening no matter what we've been told. And uh, the reason is uh, quite clear, because uh, Honey Badger don't care. Uh, in an experience survey, one third of customers after receiving a breach notification letter said they did nothing. Okay, they didn't proactively call the bank and say, cancel my card, anything like that. Well, that's not really too surprising because since a lot of people were foreclosed on uh, a few years ago by the same banks that have the credit cards, I'm sure a lot of people were actually going to the stores that were breached and saying, oh, please steal this number. I want to get back at these guys. All right. Um, but re really, one reason consumers don't care, aside from the hypothetical breach fatigue that we keep hearing about, is the Fair Credit Billing Act uh, limits on authorized charges to $50. Now, most all of you have probably gotten a letter from your credit card companies that say, oh, we cover you down to zero dollars. You owe nothing. Okay, so what's the incentive for being careful shopping online or, you know, caring if the number gets stolen from a retailer? It's not your problem. It's the people who foreclosed on your house. It's their problem, all right? So, you know, what does cause pain. Well, Batman is well known for causing pain, but not in uh, this particular case. Um, so again, we have to beat up on Aquaman too, just because. Uh, <laughs> 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 so if you pull up an oil rig, okay, that's really going to hurt your, your stock and your company's reputation. You know, if you get your, a bunch of credit cards stolen or social security numbers stolen, that's not something that people are going to be seeing on the news every day. And they're not gonna be feeling that at the grocery store whenever the price of shrimp doubles or you see Greenpeace on TV with all these oil-soaked birds. Uh, you know, the, these real-world events are what really uh, hurts companies' reputations. And from an InfoSec perspective, yeah, that is kind of sad because you have other things competing for people's attention and this sort of bad news sells more news stories than data breaches do. Um, another one that uh, came up uh, in uh, the past week was lumber liquidators. So 60 Minutes uh, did a f uh, coverage on them, uh, went to some of their factories and uh, found out that they had uh, levels of formaldehyde uh, in their product that exceeded uh, California EPA levels. So put this flooring in your house and uh, now you got all these toxic fumes coming out that exceed uh, the, the um, uh, you know, appropriate levels. Stock drops by more than 50%. You can say that lumber liquidators got hammered. Ha <laughs> ha. All right. And uh, Til Tilson Funds, uh, who's been shorting them for many years, has uh, continued to short them. And, uh, you know, they uh, run out of shares to short. There are so many short positions out there that you can't find any stock to borrow to short this thing anymore. So this one may go to zero, but they didn't have a data breach. Uh, so, you know, you're probably still thinking, uh, you know, but, you know, the InfoSec press says that CEOs get fired, and we have to make fun of Donald Trump while we're at it, too. Uh, you know, you need to get rid of that tribble on his head. So, uh, <laughs> At least I got the card cut going. All right, so the financial reality of what happened uh, you know, with Target is that they uh, had a pre-tax loss of almost $6 billion. You know, Walmart ran into the same problem uh, whenever they moved into Canada as well. You know, American companies, when they move into a different country, they tend to underestimate the complexities, you know, especially if you're in retail, supply chains and other things are just more expensive. Uh, so that's one of the things that in the Wall Street press, they talked a lot about this uh, misguided adventure into Canada. Uh, you know, a few stories mentioned like one or two lines about the data breach. But when we look at what gets people fired, uh, you know, do you lose uh, 5.4 billion? Or, you know, the data breach was 0 0.191 billion with a uh, insurance uh, coverage of 0 0.46 billion. So you had a pre-tax loss of 0 0.145 billion 
against top line revenue of 72.618 billion. Uh, in the finance world, we call this a rounding error. Uh, you know that that is uh, you know nothing significant, and as S and P said, that's not material. But when we do a fundamental analysis of what's going on, you know we look at the uh, Q4 uh, earnings call transcript. Uh, earnings per share was $1.50. Okay, they were guiding 143 to 147, so they kicked it out of the park on earnings per share. Uh, Q4 sales were up 3.8%. Okay, so it should be negative if customers are leaving. Leaving full year sales are 1.3 percent in store, and online sales are up 30 percent. Uh, you know, and Target, as they used to call it, it's kind of lost its panache. You know, a lot of people aren't really shopping there. Uh, you know, compared to what it was 10 years ago. Big tell for me though is that they increased the dividend 19.8 percent, and they paid out 1.2 billion dollars to, st to stockholders. Yes. Didn't a large number of the target board members get kicked out and they're less uh, short term than like the CEO is? Yeah, I haven't kept up with what's going on with the, uh, with the board. Uh, it's quite possible that an activist uh, investor moved in, uh, you know, to uh, take control. Uh, you know, re re really finding the numbers more interesting, but we will get to board replacement in uh, just a moment. You guys will find that interesting. So Home Depot, uh, according to their earnings call, uh, they carry 100 million in uh, cyber insurance, and their gross breach uh, expenses before insurance were 63 million, and uh, you know, after insurance that's 33 million against 83,000 million <laughs> in revenue. Ah, oh, gee, that looks like another rounding error. Okay, so uh, earnings per share up 43.8 uh, percent uh, for the fiscal year 14, up 25.3 percent. Uh, you know, so online business, they uh, said that it's 36% versus last year, increase of 13%. So their online business has doubled uh, there. And they're also increasing their dividend by 26%, so better than uh, Target. And uh, they're initiating an $18 billion share buyback program. Uh, so again, you know, these guys are apparently doing everything right. Uh, financially. Uh, Anthem is another one that was in the news lately. Uh, we uh, have not had an earnings call uh, since uh, that breach, but they have 200 million in insurance. Okay, so they got twice as much insurance as everybody else does. Uh, it would be interesting to see the financial impact, uh, especially with all the buying that's going on in their stock. So, you know, we have to ask, you know, are we spending too much on security? The vendors in the back are going to start throwing things at me in a moment. <laughs> um, but, you know, when we look at what happened to Target and uh, Home Depot, they didn't really get hurt. And, you know, as an investor, my question to Target would be, well, you had these different teams miscommunicating to each other, ships crossed in the night, nothing happened. Better off just reclaiming those synergies and uh, funneling that into a share buyback program and splitting some of it into a cyber insurance program. Just my opinion. All right, so with um, with uh, J.P. Morgan, uh, Jamie uh, Diamond's letter to the shareholders uh, in 2013 says they have a security budget of 250 million with a thousand employees. Uh, now the vendors are probably happy about that uh, because you can uh, sell a lot to a lot to J.P. Uh, Morgan. Uh, you know, a lot of small companies would be happy to have 250 million in top line revenue, let alone just having that for uh, you know a security department. Yeah, that's a nice Powerball jackpot there. Uh, you know, and in Computer Weekly after the breach, okay, they said that JP Morgan was going to double their security budget. So uh, someone, some lucky chief security officer somewhere is on his or her way to being a billion dollar CISO. Now how's that? Uh, it's almost as good as Apple being a trillion dollar company. Uh, you know, so we, we, we have to think about uh, who else out there is looking at how much is being spent on security programs. And uh, we get into the activist investors. These are some of my favorite people in, in the world. I've worked for companies uh, with similar uh, people. Top left, we got Jeff Smith of Starboard Value. Uh, top right, Dan Lueb of uh, Third Point LLC. Carl Icahn, bottom left of Icahn Enterprises. And Bill Aikman of Pershing Square. Uh, so, you know, what activist investors do is they will buy shares of a company, try to get control of the board, and most of these guys, uh, you know, some of them, not all of them, so I don't get sued, 
are, are your uh, stereotypical corporate writers, they go in, gut the company, and then sell all their shares. Other active investors out there are, you know, kind of more compliance oriented. They're, they want to get rid of child labor in the factories. You know, they'll take reduced profits for better environmental policy or getting rid of child labor. So, uh, you know, activist investors, it's a whole ecosystem just like everything else. Uh, but these guys wield a lot of power, um, as you'll see. So Starboard Value, uh, and that's Jeff Smith there, uh, uh, storming the gates of Olive Garden. Uh, his fund owned 8.8% .8 of Darden, which is the parent company that owns uh, Olive Garden and Red Lobster. And uh, he published a 294 slide on why the company sucks. Uh, just bl bl bluntly putting it. Uh, and you know, some of the stuff was like, dishwasher safe to go containers. Well, why would you spend extra money on that? Uh, you know, and then other things they were doing, they weren't putting salt in the water to cook the pasta because that would void the warranty on their cookware. So they were giving everyone crappy tasting uh, food. So in addition to some financial stuff in the um, presentation, you know, he said, look, they could just change the way they run the restaurant. So when activists call for replacement of board members, that's a campaign. So he went out and solicited the other uh, uh, investors and said, hey, I want to wipe out all 12 board members. Uh, you know, here's a presentation saying what we can do if we do it, and the shareholders approved. This guy didn't own 51% of the stock. He only owned 8.8%, and just by getting out there in an activist campaign, uh, you know, he was able to do it. You know, Business Week had a story on him, 28-year-old guy who started out with $50,000, and he would team up with guys like this and be the uh, propaganda man manager and go and talk to other shareholders. So, you know, th there's a lot of activism going on everywhere in the market. Uh, you know, to also show how much this can hurt, and uh, if you've ever run an InfoSec program uh, and you see that relational investors bought into your company, uh, yeah, you're going to have a lot of fun. Uh, so Timken is a machine shop. They make uh, ball bearings and other gears and parts. Uh, so this uh, company came in, bought up a lot of their shares, and by the time they were done, uh, the pension was cut from 33% of cash flow down to near nothing. Uh, they cut the CapEx budgets by 50% across the board, and 50% uh, of cash flow was then funneled into share buybacks to enrich the uh, shareholders. So, uh, you know, if you're running an InfoSec program and you suddenly have to do it with half the money the next day, uh, that's going to be a little painful. You're going to have to think of uh, other alternatives. So why are we talking about activist investors? Well, uh, after doing a little digging, I found Third Point LLC. And uh, according to Activist Investing Review 2014, uh, they have conducted five campaigns. Uh, they're apparently a really good company because the return uh, Dan Loeb's getting for his investors is 73.4%. Uh, so, you know, whenever you go in and start gutting companies and cutting costs, uh, you know, things really work out. Well, it turns out that Third Point uh, was an investor in Sony. Now, if we look at what uh, Relational did uh, to Timken, you know, we could probably say that there's some serious cost cutting going on at Sony as well. And, Dan Loeb was seriously going after Sony Entertainment. Well, that was the subsidiary that we heard of that got hacked back in November, December timeframe. Uh, you know, so, and what, uh, you know, Third Point said was they were trying to get the CEO to spin out Sony Entertainment and either IPO it or break it off into a separate company with different management. They felt that Sony's management was not that great. Uh, so what Sony did was they compromised and said, yeah, we're just gonna cut costs a lot. And that was enough to get Third Point out of the way. They said, well, we couldn't uh, really take over the board. We couldn't force this spin out. So uh, we're selling our stock, and we got out for 20%. Well, that was the quarter before Sony Entertainment got hacked. Now, you, you hear about how bad it was. They couldn't get access to their email, and they were faxing stuff to each other. Well, you know, Third Point made out with 20%. Well, since Sony got hacked uh, in November, December time frame, stock's up 25%, okay? So again, it may suck if you're there, but you know, for the investors, this sort of thing works out really well. Um, next area that is uh, something that uh, a, a lot of uh, InfoSec types don't really see that much of is debt covenants. Uh, you know, you, you hear about your equity investors, uh, but your debt investors are really the ones that you have to uh, really worry about because they wield a lot of power over uh, your company. You know, you have 
restrictions on your loans that uh, say that you have to have a certain debt to equity ratio or something like that. Now, in terms of debt covenants, uh, if you violate the covenant, immediately it accelerates the maturity of the loan, thus the entire balance comes due at one time. Oops, so if you got a two or three billion dollar loan, the entire balance comes due, uh, they start hitting you with late fees, and then they start digging your company's credit. And you know that's just uh, one area. You know, Radio Shack went bankrupt uh, recently because they were not able to uh, sell the company because they had a debt covenant in place, so they had to get the bank's permission to start closing stores and shutting them down. Uh, you know, other area is uh, preservation of capital covenant. Uh, this is where the banks can require you to have a certain amount of insurance. And in a lot of cases, uh, you know, you're going to have cyber insurance. You're going to have uh, you know, building fire insurance, uh, you name it. Uh, you know, you can also have restrictions against dividends that you can pay and what sort of equipment you can buy. So if you think going to the CEO and saying, oh, I want to buy this firewall or this UTM device or what have you, and you know, they say, now we can't afford it, uh, there's probably a banker somewhere in the background that said, you know, unless you've got a regulatory reason to spend money on this, we're not going to allow it. So a lot of your budgets may actually be going to the banks uh, for their approval, not just to the CFO for his approval. Uh, so you, you may have your hands tied. And some of these um, penalties are uh, immense. Uh, debt covenants are there to enrich the bankers and not the shareholders. Uh, so Lacadia Capital uh, loans some money to FXCM. They're a currency brokerage. So again, no data breach, uh, but a big financial impact. So they. In the brokerage world, if the customers don't have the money to cover losses, the brokerage has to pay. So they lost 300 million in one day. Um, and so, but Locadia came along and said, hey, we'll loan you 300 million, two year term, 10% interest, and it goes up every quarter until it hits 17%. Uh, and then they can't sell equipment, buy equipment, or do anything without going to Locadia Capital first. And then if they don't pay the loan off in three years, Locadia can force a sale of the company. So this is where your debt investors have power over your equity investors. And I just absolutely love these loan terms here. So let's say they sell the company. Uh, Locadia gets 100% of the money to pay off the loan. Next 350 million uh, from the sale, they get half of it. Any money between 350 million and 680 million, they get to keep 90% of the money. And anything after that, they keep 60%. So, uh, you know, this is why I got into finance, because this, this is, uh, you know, where all the money is. And you may think that this is unfair, but, you know, you did click I agree, so. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so, um, you know, we'll talk about uh, another area of the company that you may not deal with a lot in InfoSec, but it's very important. You need to get to know who is your head of treasury. Uh, Treasury normally handles all of your company's insurance, your workman's comp, uh, your uh, business continuity disaster insurance. But they also handle your uh, cyber insurance. And one of the interesting things when I first started going to financial conferences years ago was, you know, you got treasurers and attorneys sitting up on a panel saying, we protect the company from data breaches. It's like, well, wait a minute, you don't have any uh, IT equipment. How are you doing that? Well, they say that, you know, to a financial department, impact to a company is shown on the balance sheet. Well, if your insurance is covering you know, the consultants to do the forensics, uh, you can get insurance to cover lost revenue as an add-on. So at the end of the day, with the proper insurance coverage, it's like the Serco commercials. It's as if nothing ever happened. And you know, this is how a lot of executives, you know, they're familiar with insurance. They're not familiar with uh, you know, technology and things like that. You know, a treasurer comes to them and says, yeah, we got some cyber risk, but I bought a $200 million insurance policy, uh, and we are uh, covered. So um, what does insurance do? Well, uh, it substitutes a qualified promise for uncertainty. Um, you know, a lot of people think it's certain, but uh, when you look at the, the contracts that insurance companies have out there, uh, they're going to have a lot of exclusions. Now, unlike homeowners, renters, or automobile, uh, Cyber insurance uh, and general business insurance is very customized. It's not because they want to s sell you the hole in the donut, not the rest of the donut. It's that every company has different needs, and you know they want you to talk to your broker about you know what you can do, uh, you know and what your what your needs uh, actually are. 
so we'll talk a bit about some of the pitfalls uh, with uh, with insurance. Um, you know, cyber typically falls under errors and omissions. You know. Uh, also known as professional liability. So it's the same class as if someone slips and gets injured, uh, you know, or, uh, you know, you have a medical malpractice uh, suit. Um, you know, some of the terms to be aware of is know the difference between first party insurance and third party insurance. So your first party insurance is going to cover, uh, you know, what happens to your company. Uh, so if you have to bring in a consulting firm, forensics, PCI, stuff like that, uh, you know, that's covered under first party. Uh, insurance. If you're uh, worried about the cost of breach notification letters, things like that, that's third party. That is a third party that you have uh, wronged uh, in um, the course of your business. Uh, there's a lot of exclusions in your standard policy. So it says we don't cover terrorism or uh, military uh, conflict and things like that. Uh, so you, you, need, you need to take a look at the policy language, and this is why you need your treasury department and probably an insurance attorney looking over these things. Because think about uh, if you have five or six insurance policies, a lot of companies will try to save money by getting something with a $20 million deductible that only covers up to 50. Then they'll get a different policy that has a $50 million deductible that covers up to 70. You know, because the risk to that second insurance company, because they have 50 million of front end leeway before they have to pay anything, the premium is going to be a lot lower. So sometimes you're better off going to a single company. Other times you're better stacking different insurances. Now, if there's a clause in there that says, oh, yeah, our insurance company goes last, and you have a different insurance company that also says the same thing, you're going to end up in court, uh, you know, suing both of those insurance companies to figure out who is supposed to pay. You know, wa waste of time and energy. So do your homework up front. Uh, insurance companies are going to pull, pool you into buckets based on your industry. So if you're a retailer, you don't want to uh, be getting insurance from an oil drilling company and vice versa. Uh, so you know, talking to your insurance broker is um, you know, something that everyone uh, should do. And if you're not having the discussions with your treasury officer uh, you know, about, about this stuff, you know, about your assets, uh, what information you have, how many customers' records could be breached, uh, you know, the Treasury Department really does need to know that. Um, common exclusions and gotchas. Uh, so insurance is there to replace equipment and other things. Uh, it will not replace any lost revenue. Uh, you can buy that as additional coverage. So it's just like a disability policy. Uh, you know, so if you have your data center catch on fire or someone breaks in and deletes uh, your entire database tables while you're restoring, uh, you know, you can uh, have your revenue replaced. Uh, you know, it's the same as a business continuity policy. Uh, typically, these uh, revenue replacement policies will cover uh, your revenue from the previous quarter and pay that uh, until, um, you know, you're back up and running. Uh, you know, I've seen some debt covenants actually require companies to have two years worth of revenue coverage, uh, you know, because the banks want to get paid back. And, you know, if you've got two years to get back on your feet, uh, you know, the banks are more than likely going to get paid. Uh, the other uh, gotcha here is if the insurance policy says it covers fines and penalties, fines are technically from the government. Uh, so PCI is not government. So you need a separate policy to cover that. Um, you know, again, they're not trying to sell you the hole in the donut. They're uh, trying to make sure that you don't get too much insurance. But there's so much out there that you probably need all of it. <laughs> uh, so um, an E&O trigger uh, is a wrongful act. So if someone slips and breaks their leg, uh, you know, you're going to be uh, paying for that. Uh, security and privacy policies, uh, you know, the uh, trigger event is a security failure or a privacy event, and if you don't look at the fine print, more than likely it says it's a legislative only event. So uh, you, know, you see a lot of companies out there who will uh, do a breach notification saying, well, we're not sure if the data was stolen or we don't believe the data was stolen. Insurance won't cover that unless you buy the extra coverage uh, because that's what's called a voluntary notification. Uh, and unless the law says that you have to do it, uh, you really uh, have to t do that out of pocket unless you bought that extra insurance. So another reason why companies don't actually do the notification is they're probably sitting around with their attorneys saying, uh, yeah, we technically haven't uh, triggered the breach notification statute, so let's uh, 
not, not preemptively send any emails or anything like that. Uh, you know, you can add on a lot of things to your insurance policy uh, as well, such as punitive uh, damages. Uh, talk to your insurance attorneys about this one because some states, such as New York, uh, will prohibit insurance from paying punitive damages, only compensatory damages. Uh, so certain jurisdictions, uh, your insurance may not help you. Uh, so why pay for it unless you're actually going to get coverage? Uh, and then also, if uh, you do have one of those jurisdictions, you may want to talk to your CFO about setting money aside uh, for lawsuits and other things. Uh, you know, we, we see that a lot of the Wall Street banks set aside money to cover lawsuits from the whole housing uh, crash. Uh, we'll probably see companies setting aside money uh, to pay damages for cyber incidents as well. You just reserve that off the balance sheet and uh, you know, uh, hold on to it. Another interesting area of insurance that's uh, gonna be controversial to a lot of people in the room is cyber extortion insurance. Uh, so you, you get uh, you know, some uh, lockerware that uh, encrypts all your files, uh, or someone breaks in, doxes you, and says, hey, we're gonna put this stuff out here. Uh, well, you uh, can buy additional coverage to cover paying that off. Now, we, we hear that, oh, you should never pay a ransom. Uh, in the insurance world, uh, paying ransoms is kind of a common thing. You know, uh, some of my previous clients from years ago had kidnap and ransom insurance for all of the executives. So, you know, they're traveling in a foreign country, they get kidnapped, ransom gets posted. Insurance company will pay however mil many millions of dollars of coverage uh, the company has. You know, the different client had mercenary and rescue insurance. So they would actually cover the cost of hiring mercenaries to go stage a rescue if, if the um, you know, ransom uh, was turned down. So really, you know, you got insurance out there to send guys in balaclavas and rifles in, but eventually we're gonna get to the point where you got guys with these and laptops you know, trying to get your, get your data back. All right, so um, you know, in the few minutes we have left, uh, we're going to do a hypothetical exercise. Um, you guys probably be horrified and amused by this one. Uh, you know, so we're going to be consultants who are working for active investors to secure data and protect the company's um, assets. So um, this is the scenario. You're a compliance cult consultant for an activist investment firm. A new campaign has replaced the board and C-suite. The target company will be transformed into an investment holdings company and operations will be spun out. Target company has recently completed an acquisition uh, but has not completed a merger. Your mission is to protect the IP assets of the uh, company while producing returns for the investors. So wait a minute, we can't spend money, we can only uh, you know, cut and oh yeah, the uh, chief information officer, the CISO and the chief marketing officer were used to obtain synergies. Yes, Bill? Uh, yes, and by the, and by the dip. <laughs> okay, so um, you know my dream team is these groups here. Um, you know, whenever uh, you know we go into a company, I'm going to leverage uh, you know compliance and audit, both financial and IT. Uh, you're going to need legal involved in any sort of restructuring process, and of course you're going to need finance because you're going to be loading up on insurance. Uh, so what would you do with your audit and compliance group? Well, uh, you need to find where all your assets are so you can buy insurance on them. Uh, you know, the, the uh, financial auditors will be able to find, uh, you know, your physical assets, IT auditors will uh, help you with your information uh, assets. Uh, you know, compliance uh, and legal is going to look at your contractual requirements. Uh, one thing that I always do to uh, improve shareholder value is implement ISO 9001, 14001, 27001, whether it's a manufacturing or a data center company. Uh, because number one, you, have, you find out what your legal and contractual requirements are. Number two, it opens you up to government contracts, uh, which causes you to actually spend less money on information security. I had a client uh, about two years ago uh, who won a government contract, and in the contract it said that uh, the contractor agreed to be subject to State Freedom of Information Act for anything pursuant to that contract. So all of a sudden, the entire email form is public. Okay, so well now you don't have to spend a lot of money on DLP and other stuff to protect your email because the little town newspaper can just simply say, hey, government agency, send me all of your email and send us all of your contractor's email. Okay, well, yeah, we saved some money there, that's awesome. 
<laughs> Legal. All right, so if you're not going to put a bunch of IPSs and encryption uh, in, uh, you know, what you can do is you can patent your IP, patent, trademark, copyright, whatever. Okay, this is where we use lawyers to uh, protect the information. Um, you know, to an activist investor, uh, you know, trade secrets are bad. They can get stolen. You've got no repercussions except for the party that did the stealing. So once it's out, it's out. Uh, but if, you're, if you patent it, you can go patent trolling people and sue them for millions of dollars. And typically, you know, in, a, in an activist world, you're going to start licensing those I, uh, IP patents to the competition, you know, because hey, it's doing you no good if it's just sitting there and you're not collecting royalties from it. Uh, you know, Legal's also going to incorporate new subsidiaries, and, you know, they're going to be the ones uh, overseeing some of the compliance activities, because compliance is just going to say yes or no, you know, it, it appears to be compliant with the law. Legal's going to really take a look and say, okay, yeah, but that, even though it ticks the box, it does look kind of negligent or hokey, so, you know, we, we may or may not uh, support uh, that. Um, so finance, you know, you're going to insure your assets that, um, you know, the auditors have surfaced. And uh, the other uh, important department that's gonna be involved in one of these exercises is your tax department, because uh, trademarks, patents, and copyrights are taxed differently in different countries. So, you know, if you have a, a global company, you may, uh, and I apologize for this one, uh, you, you may have uh, reason to put some of this stuff offshore, which is why you need to talk to some licensed accountants. Uh, you know, subsidiary companies are very important. This is pulled from Tiffany and Company's 10K. And we're not going to do anything this complex where companies own companies who own companies uh, for this exercise. But, you know, uh, in, in any type of company, you can really restructure uh, like this. So the headquarters becomes the holding company. The uh, important thing in this situation is to know that the holdings company doesn't produce any goods or services. So one of the subsidiaries is going to be the operating company. And uh, you know we're going to have a real estate company, a staffing company, equipment leasing, and IP. You can stack your different business lines in separate legal entities as well. Uh, you know, and the uh, important thing about this is defense against contagion, all right? Uh, and uh, yeah, we're, we're talking financial contagion, not computer viruses. But each legal entity is self-contained. So the customers have a contract with that one company. They can only sue that one company, provided your attorneys have set it up properly. Uh, so, you know, they have separate accounting uh, books and bank accounts. So the only money at risk is what's in that bank account for that one company. And what a lot of companies do, holding companies do, is they'll charge management fees down into the subsidiaries. And, uh, you know, they will uh, move that money out of those bank accounts. So by the time you file your lawsuit, there may not be any money in that anyway. Okay, you know, this is how you protect a company ag against this sort of thing. Intellectual property, all right, uh, trademark, patent, and copyright. If you notice, this Dunkin' Donuts cup, the logo is actually owned by DDIP Holder LLC. Uh, this is important because, uh, you know, companies license Put the, put the IP for the logos and other things into one company, sometimes in a low tax jurisdiction. Amsterdam, you know, has some great coffee houses. That's probably why Starbucks went there. Um, and uh, their non-tangible is taxed at 5%. So, you know, if you look around online, you know, The Guardian and other newspapers have said, hey, Starbucks charges, uh, you know, Netherlands charges Starbucks UK like four pounds for the logo. So they're only making one pound of profit off of every cup of coffee. Uh, you know, and if you're really looking out for the shareholders, your tax department's going to be doing this, and while you're working with legal to get this stuff under trademark, you really need to be talking to your tax department. If you don't have one, I'm sure there, you can talk to one of the uh, big four consulting companies uh, out there or a mid-tier company, uh, you know, to cover that. Uh, you know, to, br uh, to bring other value to a company, you know, what we typically do is fire all the employees and hire them by a staffing company. Uh, yes, all right, Phil, Phil knows what I'm talking about. Uh, you know, the, the value here is managers give people busy work, and if they're paying by the hour, that tends to go away. It makes the employees happy. Plus, we don't have to lay people off. You know, we can actually open a new line of business contracting these employees out to other companies. Uh, you know, so you're, um, you know, saving a lot there. Uh, sale and lease of assets. Uh, you know, some people may consider this controversial. You sell buildings to get cash. You sell your source code, license it back. 
uh, why you want cash, you can drive more debt for share buybacks. That's why you want to go in debt, so you can enrich the shareholders. And uh, finally, the operating company has no real assets. There's nothing to sue for. It's easily uh, uh, replicable. So you, know, you have a restaurant or something like that. Someone falls and breaks a leg. You just spin up a new corporation. It takes less than five minutes to do online. You transfer the business licenses and everything to that new corporation. You bankrupt the old one. Boom, you're done. <laughs> All right, so Merck, mission accomplished. All right, Merck. All right, so at the end of the day, we got revenue per, per employee up. Uh, we've protected the IP by attorneys, so we don't have to spend a lot on IT. And we completed the financial renovations of the company. So uh, at the end of the day, you know, uh, when you leave here, FUD doesn't sell well. Uh, people and creativity are your greatest asset. Okay, so don't be afraid of trying something different. Uh, you know, years ago, whenever I had an activist investor take over and I thought, oh my God, we're gonna get hacked out of existence. Now, I, I've been at companies uh, as a consultant where we've had no vulnerability patching going on. We laid all those people off and put them in the staffing company for other clients. And, you know, we've, uh, you know, did not have any newsworthy data breaches d during that time. So, again, you know, if you use bankers and attorneys, it's a different way. All right, we got a question here, a question here. How many, uh, like, have you done any analysis on critical infrastructure in recent days? Uh, no, I have not. Um, you know, I have not really uh, looked at uh, power companies, nuclear companies, and so forth. They're going to be a lot more tight-lipped. And because uh, they're in a regulated environment, uh, you know, an activist investor is going to have to comply with the law, so they can't cut it and gut it uh, to the extent that uh, they would be able to in a non-regulated environment. Even breaches in, in like, so, so certain countries are subject to trade mm -hmm. So if they get a breach and they, and they have a huge blackout, then it's pretty much going to affect their prices. Um, you know, it's definitely going to affect their prices in the short term. Uh, you know, how much damage that's going to do in the long term. But again, they won't be able to cover it up as easy as other companies would be able to. But their customers aren't going anywhere either. That's true. It's a, it's a, it's a regulated monopoly. So, uh, you know, and we can see with Target and others. Yeah, then that changes the whole And Andy? Yeah, just, you know, build my watch. Okay. I get laid off on Monday. <laughs> okay, that is awesome. Well, what he's going to do is he's going to stick you in the staffing company, and then you're going to be working in some uh, call center. So there you go. It's a coal mine. All right, um, I think we're... We have, we have time for like one more question. Okay, uh, in, the, in the very back with the baseball cap. All right, well, I had a client a few years ago that did this. Now, in China, uh, one thing that the government will do when you first start doing business there, and you always want to do business with China, uh, not because I'm wearing a Chinese flag pin on my suit or anything like that, um, but you always want to do business with China because, okay, th th they're, they're hypothetically could be bad actors. You know, they could be bad actors in Russia, too. Um, you know, a client I had a few years ago, uh, you know, what they did was they went to the Chinese government and said, oh, uh, you're going to license this IP for 10 years. Now, the standard IP agreement is typically five. And uh, what, the, what the Chinese uh, will sometimes do is you start doing business there, and they say, oh, by the way, you owe us a business tax, uh, but you can get out of paying the tax if you license your intellectual property to us. Well, now, now they have your blueprints and everything. So my client went uber aggressive with them and said, oh, great, we'll license everything that you want, but uh, you're going to pay us for 10 years, and you're going to have Delaware as the court venue, uh, so you're not going to get out of it uh, you know, by uh, break, breaking the contract. You know, as Elon Musk said, if you're dependent on your patents for more than five years, you're doing it wrong. So you know, by forcing your business partners into a long-term licensing agreement, hypothetically, they could be paying for uh, IP licenses uh, after something has lived past its useful lifetime. All right, thanks very much. Appreciate it. So yeah. I'll be at the reception afterwards, so if you want to talk to me, feel free.